Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Boutin. I'm Bishop for Romanian Byzantine Catholics in the United States and in Canada. It sounds like a big deal. <laughs> I assure you, it's not. Um, I often like to say to Father Emmanuel Charles McCarthy, who I have I've been uh, given actually more and more notice this time from Mike Griffin than I usually get. <laughs> uh, five minutes to introduce Father McCarthy. Um, <clears throat> I'm a nobody bishop of a nothing diocese, <laughs> and that's just fine for me. I asked Father how I should kind of introduce him because we've known each other for a long time. So far, we're both still getting up on, on, on this side of the graph. But you get the feeling, having gotten to know Father McCarthy, that that's not the whole story, and that's kind of where I kind of <coughs> wanted to start. When you meet somebody like Father McCarthy, words come to mind that come from the great tradition of you know, the English drama. Words in, to introduce him, so what came to mind was I come to bury Caesar, not to pray. <laughs> no, no, I thought that that's not going to work. How about will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? <laughs> I thought no, no, no that's not going to work. And then I thought about Linda Loma. Attention must be paid. Attention must be paid. I had the privilege of. First hearing Father McCarthy speak as he was giving his first introductory lecture to uh, the seminarians at St. Gregory's Balkite Seminary in Newton, Massachusetts, which I was literally walking down the stairs to leave. And it was in no small measure, owing to those couple of words that I heard, because I stuck my ear against the door for a little while, that in a couple of years I was back, for well or ill. And at that time, Father McCarthy was the spiritual director. It was not Father McCarthy, but he was the spiritual director of uh, St. Gregory Seminary. I came back in 1980, I believe it was. And then in 1980, October of 1980, in uh, Rottenwood Center, I think that was the name of it, I went to a, a retreat that Father gave. And I can show you the notes on that day when I he was in the middle of his presentation at that time called Christian Nonviolence, The Great Failure, The Only Hope. And I wrote, this is it. This is it. Now, you can be a big fish in a small pond. You can be a small pond and a big fish, I suppose. I don't know. I've come to know Father McCarthy as somehow a very small, kind of like rock or pebble, that somehow fell into the mystery of my own existence as, it has, as rocks have fallen into the mystery of everyone's existence, on account of which the ripples keep happening, one way or another. I've been a bishop for 18, 17 years, and I've been going to conferences, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, meetings for 20 years. But the first time I went to one of those meetings, it was in 1982, when the U.S. bishops were debating what was then famously and inaccurately called the Peace Pastor. And the first meeting I went to was to hand out the leaflet, the bishops, if you will, hand out a piece called Christian uh, Epistles of the Church in the 20th century, written by a priest and sinner. It was Father McCarthy, of course, and he made sure today that I let you know that he wrote it. Because of all the things that may have happened to him and to me and to all of us, once that rock has fallen into our existence, once the mystery of who God is and what his plan is for the world and what his plan is for each of us, once that has happened to us, the one thing that we can count on all the time from the time we hear the good news until the time we can no longer hear, except for the angelic choirs, is that we are sinners. That stays the same. And so while some have, as I have, come to be challenged again and again, 
by the words, the clear words, the clear understanding of the mission and message of Jesus Christ that Father McCarthy gives. And knowing how badly I have been a student of that, as well as how badly I have been a disciple of Jesus Christ, it is in knowing the whole gospel. That Father McCarthy has not been unwilling to preach. That I know that as surely as I am a sinner, I know that God is love. That's the foundational message that I got, on account of which I wrote in my notes in 1980, this is it. So while I may introduce Father McCarthy as someone who's been a student here, who's been a member of the faculty here at Notre Dame, until Father Hesburgh, the Vietnam War, and probably the will of God intervened, as somebody who's not always been a priest, but has also been an attorney for a while, someone who's one of the most brilliant people you will ever meet. One of the things I would just like to say as I prepare to introduce my friend and my father is that the ripples are still going out. They're going out for all of you here in your own life. And I'm sure whatever Father McCarthy has to say today is going to drop a rock into the middle of your, the mystery of your existence, as it always does. But as you begin to see your life in new ways, as you begin to see the church that you've never seen before, as perhaps you've begun to experience a gospel that you've never experienced before, although I have a feeling that just pretty much everybody here knows something about it. Know that Father McCarthy, priest, and a sinner has been drawn, I believe, as we all have, out of nothingness into existence for a purpose. His vision of that purpose is clear. His willingness to follow it is absolute. And on account of that, while I may be burying him with what I'm saying, while I may be continuing to make of him the meddlesome priest that bishops the world over have found him to be. I also want to encourage you this evening as you listen, as we say in the Byzantine liturgy, to be attentive. Attention must be paid. And so I give you, as our Lord has given you, Father Manuel Charles of Christ. Blessed is our God, all the time is now and always and forever and ever. Well, David, uh, you know, when, uh, when uh, I signed that first epistle of the 20th century that I wrote, that John was talking about giving up, I signed the priest and sinner. And uh, I'll have you know that's over 30 years before the Pope signed himself as a senator. <laughs> but you know, the peace movement is a funny thing, you know? It's, a, it's got as many problems as the church itself. And people started accusing me, you know, he doesn't want to stand up for what he's saying, he's hiding behind priests and senators, so I start signing my name. And sure enough. But anyway, you know, when one called me, you know, and he asked me to do this, I said, oh, gee. Sure, I would, that'd be great. That'd really be great to, to, to give that talk. 
everything. I know his name. And then he called up a little while later, you know, he didn't want to talk to his week, as a matter of fact. And he said, you know, he said, don't go too long because a lot of these people here are old people. They can't, they can't take it. You know? They can't take it. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, and then he called up like a half a day later or something. Said, you really shouldn't go too long because they're young. They really don't have good attention, you know. And he, and he uh, so I uh, went to Mrs. and he, you know, and he said, you know, I think we ought to be out by 20 after I could be because the world said, oh, he said, because that's all they can take. <laughs> I said, say, Louis. <laughs> and it's kind of like the world series. <laughs> You know, when I first came into this church, it was 55 years ago. 55 years ago, I walked from the St. Bernard Church as a freshman here at Notre Dame. And I, I, was, I was truly impressed. Now, this, is the, this is the old church that we're talking about here in 1958. This is the Latin Mass. I mean, everything was in Latin. That was, that was it. And, uh, but the church was pretty much as it is now, exactly as you see it now, except for the turning around the altar. But the altar that was here is still here, and so forth, and St. Marcellus is uh, relic in it. And um, so 55 years ago, I, was, I, I, I walked into this church for the first time. And, um, and, and I mean, I, just looking at the huge percentage of it here, I would ask the question, where were you 55? <laughs> it's an interesting question. But, so I, I, you know, I often came here. Oh, very, very often came here. I like that chapel, I like this chapel. But, you know, it was, um, I don't know if this was one of the first things that got me started thinking about the possibility that Jesus was not vital, and that's how he wanted his disciples to act, his followers to act, but that's what the gospel said. Uh, it was one of the first things, let's say it wasn't the first thing, but it was one of the first things. So I'm 18 years old, and I, uh, I'm in the church, and, and uh, maybe a couple of months after I first got to know me, I start moving around, looking at the, the back and the sides and everything, it was very beautiful. And uh, I'm an Irish Catholic guy from Boston, you know. And um, that no, that announced a problem with, with uh, uh, <clears throat> the military or anything else. Non violence was a non thought in the Irish Catholic world, you know. But anyway, in the 40s and 50s, anyway, I was rolling around the church and I came and, uh, and then I came over here. To this stained glass window, this, you can't see it's dark. To this stained glass window, that is just to the left of uh, Basil Road, and, and for the first time in my life, I'm shocked with this sort of thing because that stained glass window has two stories on it: one story above, one story below. And the first story is a, is a rather gruesome picture of crusaders killing Muslims. And the story below on the stained glass window is an equally gruesome uh, picture of uh, the Battle of Alcantara, where uh, Catholics killed Muslims. 300 years later than the Crusades. Now, I had heard about the Crusades, and I had heard about the Battle of These are all just part of Catholic. And I'd seen pictures in my church history books and so forth, and they really didn't strike me as, that's just part of what you are as a Catholic. You, know? you fight for your you fight for your church, you fight for your country, you fight for your family, you fight for yourself. But what struck me about those pictures, they just, just shocked me, absolutely shocked me, was in both pictures, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Blessed Mother, is actually in them as supporting the killing on the Catholic side. 
Now, I knew Jesus supported it, but not his body. <laughs> My heavens. So, so anyway. So anyway. So anyway, that really shocked me. And it's just, you can look at it. There's Mary. There is Mary, and she's, she's helping the Catholics kill the Muslims. 300 years apart. And so, that, I just, that didn't, that didn't fit me. Jesus, yeah, there we go. God, yes, you know. Even all kinds of saints, yes, you know. But Mary, because, you know, the Catholics are Mary. She's Queen of Peace, she's Mother of Jesus. And she, she, just, she's a nice person. <laughs> I mean, she's there to help, you know? That's all she's there for, is to help. I have never heard of even of her Irish that the Blessed Mother was, was, was uh, giving comfort and support and aid to killing people. It has never entered my mind. And I just began to think about it, and it just didn't make a lot of sense. But I said, yeah, it has to be okay. It's the Catholic <laughs> Church. You know, beautiful Catholic Church. Well, it wasn't okay, but that took a long time to figure out. Now, it was, uh, when I came here, back in 1958, and pretty much for all the years I was here, as an undergraduate from 62, the only prayers that were said in English in this church was um, the only time the Gospels went in English on Sunday. Other than that, everything was in Latin. Everything was in Latin. I'm going to give you a little taste of what that was like. Right? Now, nothing was in English. Huh? So, I mean, every word was in Latin. And so here, this is all for example. Could be said that the Sere Autumn Quidit Ant, Antiquam, Nautusicet, Accidentari, Est, Semper, Esum, Pura. Well, you know, what does that mean here? <laughs> Nothing. I mean, no. Discussion on this map. 
The supreme value of the Christian family is that each and every one of the children become a saint and that the mom and dad become a saint. Everything is sacred. There is no value that is superior to that. That is the ultimate value of the Christian family. Because if everyone doesn't become a saint, the Christian family, the Christian mother and father, have failed. Or brothers and sisters, everyone. Why? Well, you know, every human being, every single human being on the face of the earth, has within their a fundamental, ultimate principle they live by. Not necessarily what they articulate, but what they actually make their choices in terms of. It takes a little time for some people to figure out that what they're saying is not what they're living for. Sometimes several thousand years. <laughs> but we are living, each and every one of us, by something that is a value that controls our decisions, that then impregnates every point of the decisions that we make. Let me put it this way. If Jesus doesn't come with the good news that everyone has the possibility of being a saint, that you and those that you love can live in love forever, <laughs> that death is not simply a shovel of sand in the face and then it's over and done until the worms destroy the body. If Jesus doesn't come with the good news, that eternal life, eternal survival is possible for you and, I'll watch this, and those that you love. Rabbi Abraham Heschel, Kind of a Jewish Thomas Merton, real bright, bright well. Yeah? Abraham Heschel writes that the that the desire for immortality, the desire for immortality, originates not in my desire simply to have perpetual duration, but it originates in question. doesn't come with the good, good news that eternal salvation is possible for each and every one. What good news is there? There is no good news. You could win. 
been well, you you could win the Powerball lottery tomorrow. Eight hundred twenty million dollars. And the day after, the doctor says you got terminal cancer. The Powerball Powerball lottery is. And so it is with all the good news we have. Name it. I got a promotion. My child has gotten into number name. Why? You name it. If it all ends in the sound of the fury that signifies nothing, And life is just a bad dream for a few minutes, the end of which there is extinction not only for me, but for all those I love. And so, and so we can kind of think about it a little bit. We come here today because St. Marcellus, uh, St. Marcellus relics,
then it makes no sense at all rationally. To sacrifice other people's families to God's. In the context of the gospel is diabolical. It's false witness. Because the Jesus of the gospel, who is the incarnation of God of all heaven and earth, is the incarnation of selfless, non-violent love, self-sacrificing non-violent love for other people. Right up and unto death. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. So, St. Marcellus' bones are here. But if St. Marcellus is dead and gone, never to be heard of again, then there's no big deal being here. Bones are bones. Whether they're human bones under those circumstances, bones are bones. Whether they're human bones or dog bones. But St. Marcellus made a choice. He made a choice about what was going to be the ultimate value that was going to govern his life. The ultimate value that was going to govern his life was God incarnate, Jesus. His teaching and his way and his example, these were the power and wisdom of God in them. This was the dynamic that led to eternal life for one and all. This made sense of life. So he was a Roman captain. We don't know, maybe he, was, he went to some Roman university, went to the to the equivalent of our OTC. But he was a Roman captain in the history of Centurion. Made a nice living, had children, had a wife. And because of that fundamental, supreme, supreme value that governed his own life, that Jesus was the incarnation of God and fidelity to that value. Because, remember, you can't say, Jesus, I believe in you, but I don't believe you. That's impossible. That's crazy God. Jesus, I believe in you, but I don't believe you. How can you not believe in if it's God? God's, God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't lie. So Jesus comes along and he says, love your enemies, be good to you, those wage, you put up your sword, and so forth. And Marcellus, is that being his, his simple value, the value that governs his whole life, his supreme value, Fidelity to Jesus Christ, obedient fidelity to Jesus Christ, in word and in deed, thought and action. Then, he went to the, uh, the Roman procurator who was over him, the superior. And in the words of the old African-American spiritual, he said to this authority figure that had all the power of the world behind him right up to Caesar, he said to him, in the words of the old African-American spiritual, we lay down our salt and shield, down by the riverside, for a study of the He knew. He knew what the consequences of that was because he was a Roman soldier. He knew that death was probably going to come to him and to his loved ones. But he laid down his sword and shield. Wouldn't do war no more. So, um, where we're at here is that he did it. And of course, that's 1700 years.
truth at all? And so the question is, or the truth is, if Marcellus laid down his sword and shield and by that time refused to do war no more, then, if he is dead, if he is extinct, if he and his family will never be again, then run as fast as you can from Jesus and his teaching. Run. Don't walk. Dash. Because Jesus is dead wrong. <coughs> dead wrong. <coughs> So, it really is, uh, because all we have here are just bones now. Just bones. And of course, you know, that uh, Latin sentence that I gave you at the beginning here, yeah. Said I ought to quit on the farm. Not just cease accidental in a simple essay where means. Not to know what happened and why it happened before you were born. It is to be a child forever. Not to know what happened and why it happened. Before you were born, is to be a child of death. The problem with being a child forever, that's from Cicero, by the way, the problem with being a child forever is <coughs> not that children sin, but children do evil things. The distinction between sin and evil being evil is what is contrary to the will of God as revealed by Jesus the Christian. Sin is the free choosing to do what is contrary to the will of God as revealed by Jesus. Children don't sin, but they can't do evil. And the consequences will go out. Child accidentally picks up his father's loaded gun or something and pulls the trigger and kills the other child. Dad, have no attention doing such a thing. So there's no sin. But boy, there's evil, and there are evil consequences that flow under generations for that. Not to know what happened before you were born and why is to be a child forever. came here 55 years ago, I did not know about saying myself. But here is what I was taught from this school, my sophomore year. The book is called Christian Virtues, and it was written by Reverend Charles Shee, CSC. Who was dean of the uh, Arts and Letters School, I was here before and after, and he, was, he had a doctorate in sacred theology. And on one page 191 of the book, this is where I was taught. <coughs> page 191, this, this would have been 1959, the year, uh, the year after I got here, I was taught, and I put this in the domain of the
As I say, non-violence was a non It just didn't, it was, it was not possible to fail. And so, and so I just, this is the way life was at that time. And what I mean by that,
that kept me as a child. Because I knew damn right well that if you could kill your enemies, or you could do harm to your enemies, that there were options here, you didn't have to love your enemies. I could think of a lot of enemies I had that uh, I could keep my powder dry in case anything ever dropped out. So if St. Marcellus is dead and gone, if those are only bones there, like dog bones, then it's good to follow just war theory, which Jesus never taught, which is the antithesis of what he taught, which is not the way to eternal life for ourselves or our loved ones. Our fight is wonderful to follow. Matter of fact, I even say follow it. If my soul is dead and gone, if these are just bones. In fact, I'd say, using some sharp lyrics from a song back in 1965 by Tom Paxton, he says, here's, here's, here's a song.
That's what St. Marcel is supposed to. Because that's the life he chose. When he chose to follow Jesus, obey Jesus, follow him unto death, he wasn't thinking that life ended in the grave. He was thinking eternal life starts now. And so, do we raise our children? Because remember what we're talking about here. Christian family families. Do we raise our children in the Christian family to desire to be holy, to desire to be saints, to develop the habits of thought and mind and spirit and energy? that are in conformity with the mind of Christ, conformity with the non-violent, conquering Lamb of God? <coughs> or do we raise them with the toys we give them, with what we say, with the values we impart by our conversations, by the schools we send them to? To function as if longevity was the only thing. Above all else, to be 
these states. Versus to being G.I. Joes, Rambos, greedy, lustful, envious, selfish people. And then put a cover on all that and say, that's Christian. That's it. One drop of poison. One drop of poison, one drop of poison can contaminate the most life-giving bread in the world. One drop of poison. You can have a barrel of medicine here that can heal everything, and you put one drop of poison in it, the whole thing is contaminated. What happens when I receive the bread of life? Who is Jesus Christ? Who is the nonviolent Lamb of God? What is going on when I receive the bread of life and I do not have any intention at all of becoming Christ like? My intention is to become worldly and put Jesus' name on it. I'm not a, I'm, I have no intention of loving my enemies, forgiving those who have injured me, etc., etc., etc. It's a dog eat dog world out there, and I'm a just fire as Christian. What is it that's going on? Is that poisoning the Eucharistic celebration? To have the community coming like that? Remember? The night before he was murdered by the state again, Martin Luther King Jr. gave that famous talk, famous talk, down in Memphis. And part of that talk was, he said, and he knew, he knew they were after him. He knew the state, the wealth, the power were after him. And in that talk he said, Longevity has its place, but longevity is not everything. And he got a bullet in the head the next day for helping garbage men. Garbage men. How many of us raise our children with holiness, with loving enemies, doing good to those who hate you, being merciful people? as Jesus is, in order to help the nobodies. When you look up at the dome, I right love you, of this beautiful church, and you look up at it and you see there's Moses and there's, there's everyone's up there. <laughs> Angels and saints. Right in the middle, separated. Separated. Is the cross of Christ and the words under it are Spes Unica. One. Christ is not a way to eternal life, he is the way to eternal life. Believe it or not. How God works that, we don't know. But when God chooses you and I, and he does choose us, we don't choose him. When God chooses you and I to be Christian, to be his followers, he wants us to live that, our life by that one book. And what he does with the ripples with that, that's his job. But if we place our hope in all kinds of other things, and be even willing to kill for all kinds of other things, and break with that one hope that's Jesus, the ripples will go up, but they won't be salvific for anybody. So, I leave you with this. St. Marcellus is as alive as Christ is alive. And no one has ever lived and died who is now as alive as Christ.
everything, everything in Christian morality, everything in family values, depends upon Christ is risen. But if Christ is risen, there is a logical network of obligations, responsibilities that flow from that. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.